it seems like one part of the future of crypto is coming into focus, and it may be this. Layer twos, if we can use that term broadly to describe everything beyond mainnet for purposes of this conversation, are going to be built out to such an extent on every blockchain that it'll be trivial to have an extra layer for any particular use case, whether that's very high transactions per second or a particular programming paradigm or whatever. And counterintuitively, that's actually going to reinforce the primacy of layer one efficiency and strength to the benefit of Cardano. Ready? Let's go. We've already talked on this channel about how everyone's gonna have layer twos and side chains. In fact, because of similar needs, those additional layers beyond mainnet may end up matching across ecosystems to such an extent that the only differentiating factor will end up being the base protocol they're connected to, and this circumstance will massively favor Cardano. I'm not sure if anything recently has more strongly signaled the coming of this future layerverse, yes, I'm calling it a layerverse, than this tweet from Vitalik. After all of the super strong criticism of potential layer twos on Cardano from Ethereum maximalists, it was super hilarious to see this tweet from Vitalik about how he basically wants to move all of the Ethereum NFT activity onto layer two. If you follow Vitalik's link, he has this complex plan for NFTs involving a dual roll-up system uh, where they would wrap the NFTs and do, do transactions on layer two, and then they're, they're unwrapped and unrolled. I'll let you read all about it if you're interested. But actually, maybe the most interesting thing about Vitalik's tweet is the reaction down in the comments. This poster says, I'm a long-term hodler of ETH, not because I believe in them anymore. It is just because if I pay the fees to swap out ETH, my investment get, gets cut in half. This was a genius plan to force retail investors to never sell. Very good, very good point, my friend. <laughs> then he says, weren't all the ETH maxis ripping on Cardano for suggesting an L2 solution for concurrency? Just saying. Then we have another comment down here kind of in a different direction. Uh, this guy says, curious what you think the effects of this might be on the Solana ecosystem. And someone who's obviously a strong ETH supporter with his dot ETH handle there in his, uh, in his username says, Solana is a feature of Ethereum. If ETH2 launches soon, rest in peace, Solana. This is very interesting. He's, he's thinking the same thing that I think a lot of people are thinking, that any special functionality, in this case, very high transactions per second, can get absorbed in the future in any large blockchain through what I'm calling the layerverse. Of course, in his case, he's probably thinking this will happen on mainnet, but we'll talk about that in just a second. At that point, people launched into what is inevitable in almost any Ethereum thread these days with people saying things like this, vitamin, I just paid $700 to sell a coin for a $20 loss. Fix Ethereum now. <laughs> I love it. He's calling, he's calling metallic vitamin. Uh, you also saw really interesting, really interesting screenshots like this one. At least this person is calling him by his name, Vitalik, and he posted this. Looks like he's trying to make a payment of $34.41 in Ethereum, 0.01 Ethereum, Ether rather, and the miner fee was going to be $7,956.14, illustrating the absurdity of Ethereum transaction fees. In his tweet, Vitalik was obviously focused on NFTs, and that's the solution he presented, one for putting NFTs on layer two. But the comments make it super obvious, it's not just NFTs, it's DeFi and everything else on Ethereum as well. Ethereum users can see it, and so can everybody else. Of course, Ethereum supporters are hoping that Ethereum 2.0 will save them not just in this way, but pretty much always. But as this article points out, Ethereum 2.0 may not be the most efficient way to do proof of stake. Granted, this article is based on a University College London study and University College London 
has some kind of an association with a governing council for Hedera. And of course they found Hedera to be the most, the most efficient. So raise an eyebrow, raise a crypto eyebrow to that. But it does make the point that just switching from proof of work to proof of stake isn't exactly some kind of panacea to all problems. As Charles has pointed out in the past, the difference between proof of stake and proof of work is substantially just one of how you decide who gets to validate the block. You still have to validate the block and do whatever computation is required by the transactions in that block. In Ethereum's case, with their global state, this means a huge amount of computation in some cases. And global state isn't changing with Ethereum 2.0 which as you can see from the ethereum.org website on the ETH 2.0 merge has had a bunch of different impacts, including this. Originally, the plan was to work on shard chains before the merge to address scalability. However, with the boom of layer two scaling solutions, the priority has shifted to swapping proof of work to proof of stake via the merge. So they even gave up, they even gave up the plan of sharding as part of Ethereum 2.0. We've had we've seen Vitalik make comments kind of kind of related to this. Even even sharding had to be sacrificed because global state was such an integral part of the system and the way solidity works. I'm sure certain types of Ethereum maximalists would argue that global state had nothing to do with delaying sharding and sharding is certainly going to come at some point. But to be honest, I have yet to have anybody explain to me how sharding is easy with global state. But back to the point at hand, it does look like Ethereum is going to rely very heavily on layer two and ZK rollups, and everybody else is gonna be relying on layer two as well. A lot of layer twos are going to be about achieving very high transactions per second with some degree of sacrifice of decentralization on the layer two while other layers beyond mainnet like a lot of side chains will be more about things like special programming paradigms we're already seeing this in the cardano world with uh milcomeda side chain which will be an ethereum virtual machine side side chain where ethereum developers will be able to wrap their solidity smart contracts deploy them on this side chain and then and then cardano users will be able to use them with wrapped ada by the way, huge credit to Charles in his recent video for pointing out the strong difference of opinion between DC Spark and IOHK. I think that was probably a reference to this because I think, and you know, Charles said that was okay. He said that was perfectly fine. I think there's a huge amount of intellectual honesty in that because a lesser leader of a blockchain like Cardano with a functional smart contract programming language like Plutus, which is basically just a subset of Haskell, probably would have called a solidity sidechain of the mainnet a straight up perversion of the uh, functional underpinnings of the whole blockchain. So I I mean I think we I think most people in Cardano would probably agree Charles is nothing if not intellectually honest. But this Mill Commodus sidechain project of DC Spark illustrates the point every blockchain is going to want these additional layers to do all kinds of different stuff, whether it's just to achieve higher TPS or it's to accommodate some specific programming paradigm like the Ethereum virtual machine. In this case, all of these additional layers beyond the main nets will become kind of commoditized and modular deploying a solidity or JavaScript or Plutus or C plus plus smart contract won't really depend any longer on which blockchain supports that language because some side chain or compiler or something on a multitude of different blockchains will support it. Competition will eventually render these smart contract deployment environments fairly similar in the same way that a Honda Accord isn't really that different from a Toyota Camry in substantial terms we could end up with a multiverse of layers beyond l1 a layer verse where people will have their choice of many 
similar layers all residing on different blockchains, each of which presenting a similar environment. This isn't to say that there won't be unique categories of layers existing on large blockchains, because there will. But there will also be this genericization of certain types of layers. And with regard to those, the only thing that will be different, substantially different, the things that would sway a decision are probably the main nets that those extra layers settle on. Here's where Cardano has a huge advantage. Cardano has struck the very best balance of security, decentralization, and scaling with whole cloth new technology that's substantially different than the old Casper style proof of stake with slashing. What we've seen with a lot of the blockchains that have declared themselves to be in the generation three platform race is that no matter what buzz terms they throw around about their blockchain, it's all too easy for them to just default to the status quo thinking about Casper and slashing. But if you think about it in simple terms, as a delegator participating in a staking system, you are putting your assets on the table in exchange for a share of the block validation rewards. In all the Casper type proof of stake systems like Ethereum and Solana apparently, that sliding of your chips to the center of the table actually involves real risk of losing those chips through slashing or even by mishap, as we've already seen in Ethereum's custodial stake pool mistakes involving key loss and things like that. In Cardano, there is no such risk. Ouroboros doesn't have slashing, and you don't have to give custody of your stake to the stake pool. So those kinds of stake loss incidents can't really happen. This is economically relevant. At the end of the day, as a delegator in a proof of stake system, are you going to demand a greater return on your delegation in the system where your stake is at risk or the one where there is no slashing or custodial stake pool risk? It's obvious that you'll want a greater reward in the system where you might actually lose your stake. That heightened demand for return in exchange for risk will be passed onto the network and eventually the user involved in the transactions being validated. As Charles has pointed out on a bunch of different occasions, somebody has to pay for all that computation at the end of the day. Either it's the end user or it's somehow subsidized in the network. That's why the most efficient mainnet with the most decentralization probably isn't going to involve Casper and slashing it's going to look a lot more like Cardano and Ouroboros. The extra layers beyond mainnet in the layerverse will probably end up looking kind of similar. I mean, they have similar needs they're fulfilling. They're, try they're trying to create the possibility of doing similar things. But developers and end users alike will end up choosing the ones that are connected to the most decentralized and efficient main nets. Because those additional layers in the layerverse, they all have to settle on the L1s. They all have to achieve finality on the main nets. And there's going to be a big difference in that settling on a Casper and slashing based L1 versus an L1 that looks more like Ouroboros. And it goes without saying that the history of crypto has shown us that the greater the decentralization in those L1s, the more they'll be trusted. That's why it's my bet that the preferred mainnet for the Layerverse will be Cardano. Talk to you tomorrow.